those that don't know me, my name is Connie, and if you're new to my channel, I'd like to welcome you. And if you are new, let me know in the comments down below. Let me know how you found out about my channel, and let me know a little bit about yourself so I can start to get to know you better. So, I want to apologize. I am late with doing this video. Um, I have not been feeling the best the last few days. I had woken up with a headache, and then after that, I just have been re feeling really tired. So, today, I'm trying to play catch-up. So, today, we are going to be reading Chapter 3. And Chapter 3 is called, Mr. John Bailey Appears. I had dinner served in the breakfast room. Somehow, the huge dining room depressed me. And Thomas, cheerful enough all day, allowed his spirits to go down with the sun. He had a habit of watching the corners of the room, left shadowy by the candles on the table, and altogether it was not a festive meal. Dinner over, I went into the living room. I had three hours before the children could possibly arrive, and I got out my knitting. I had bought along two dozen pairs of, of slipper soles in assorted sizes. I always sent knitted slippers to the old lady's home at Christmas, and now I sorted over the wools with a grim determination not to think about the night before, but my mind was not on my work. At the end of a half hour, I found I had put a row of blue scallops on Eliza Kleinfelter's lavender slippers, and I put them away. I got out the coupling and went into the pantry. Thomas was wiping silver and the air was heavy with tobacco smoke. I sniffed and looked around, but there was no pipe to be seen. Thomas, I said, you have been smoking. No, ma'am. He was injured innocence itself. It's on my coat, ma'am, over at the club, the gentleman. But Thomas did not finish. The pantry was suddenly filled with the odor of singeing cloth. Thomas gave a clutch at his coat, whirled to the sink, filled a tumbler with water, and poured it into his right pocket with the celerity of practice. Thomas, I said, when he was sheepishly mopping the floor, smoking is a filthy and injurious habit. If you must smoke, you must, but don't stick a lighted pipe in your pocket again. Your skin's your own. You can blister it if you like, but this house is not mine, and I don't want a conflagration. Did you ever see this cufflink before? No, he had, he had never had, he said, but he looked at it oddly. I picked it up in the hall, I added indifferently. The old man's eyes were shrewd under his bushy eyebrows. There's strange going on here, Miss Eames, he said, shaking his head. Something's going to happen, sure. You ain't took notice that the big clock in the hall is stopped, I reckon. Nonsense, I said. Clocks have to stop, don't they? If they're not wound, it's wound up all right, and it stopped at three o'clock last night, he answered solemnly. More than that, that their clock ain't stopped for fifteen years, not since Mr. Armstrong's first wife died. And that ain't all, no ma'am. Last three nights I slept in this place. After electrics went out, I had a token. My oil lamp was full of oil, but it kept going out. Do what I would, minute I, sh I, I sheet my eyes out, that lamp go. There ain't no sure token of death. The Bible says, let your light shine. When a hand you can't see puts your light out, it means death, sure. The old man's voice was full of conviction. In spite of myself, I had a chilly sensation in the small of my back, and I left him mumbling over his dishes. Later on, I heard a crash from the pantry, and Liddy reported that Bella, who is a coal black, had darted in front of Thomas just as he picked up a tray of dishes, that the bad omen had been too much for him, and he had dropped the tray. The chug of the automobile as it climbed the hill was the most welcome sound I had heard for a long time, and with Gertrude and Hosley actually before me, my troubles seemed over for good. Gertrude stood small, smiling in the hall with her hat quite, o quite over one ear, and her hair in every direction under her pink veil. Gertrude is a very pretty girl, no matter, no matter how her hat is, and I was not surprised when Hasley presented a good-looking young man 
who bowed at me and looked at Trude. That is the ridiculous nickname Gertrude brought, brought from school. I have bought a guest, Aunt Ray Hasley said. I want you to adopt him into your affections and your Saturday to Monday list. Let me present John Bailey, only you must call him Jack. In 12 hours, he'll be calling you Aunt. I know him. We shook hands and I got a chance to look at Mr. Bailey. He was a tall fellow, perhaps 30, and he wore a small mustache. I remember wondering why. He seemed to have a good mouth and when he smiled, his teeth were above the average. One never knows why certain men cling to a messy upper lip that must get into things any more than one understands some women building on up their hair on wire atrocities. Otherwise, he was a very good t to look at, stalwart and tan, with the direct gaze that I like. I am particular about Mr. Bailey because he was a prominent figure in what happened later. Gertrude was tired with the trip and went up to bed very soon. I made up my mind to tell them nothing until the next day and then to make as light of our excitement as possible. After all, what, I, what had I to tell? An inquisitive face peering in at a window, a crash in the night, a scratch or two on the stairs, and a half a cuff button. As for Thomas and his forebodings, it was always my belief that a Negro is one part thief, one part pigment, and the rest superstition. It was Saturday night. The two men went to the billet room, and I could hear them talking as I went upstairs. It seemed that Hosley had stopped at the Greenwood Club for gasoline and found Jack Bailey there. With the Sunday golf crowd, Mr. Bailey had not been hard to persuade. Probably Gertrude knew why, and they had carried him off triumphantly triumphantly. I roused Liddy to get them something to eat. Thomas was beyond reach in the lodge and paid no attention to her evident terror of the kitchen regions. Then I went to bed. The men were still in the billet room. When I finally dozed off and the last thing I remember was the howl of a dog in front of the house. It wailed a crescendo of woe that trailed off hopefully only to break out afresh from a new point of the compass. At three o'clock in the morning, I was roused by a revolver shot. The sound seemed to come from just outside my door. For a moment, I could not move. Then I heard Gertrude stirring in her room, and the next moment she had thrown open the connecting door. Oh, Aunt Ray! Aunt Ray! She cried hyster hysterically. Someone has been killed! Killed! Thieves, I said shortly. Thank goodness there are some men in the house tonight. I was going into my slippers and a bathroom, and Gertrude, with shaking hands, was lighting a lamp. Then we opened the door into the hall, where crowded up the upper landing of the stairs. The maids, white-faced and trembling, were peering down, headed by Liddy. I was greeted by a series of low screams and questions, and I tw tried to quiet them. Gertrude had dropped on a chair and sat there limp and shivering. I went at once across the hall to Hosley's room and knocked. Then I pushed the door open. It was empty. The bed had not been occupied. He must be in Mr. Bailey's room, I said excitedly. And followed by Liddy, we went there. Like Hosley's, it had not been occupied. Gertrude was on her feet now, but she leaned against the door for support. They have been killed, she gasped. Then she caught me by the arm and dragged me towards the stairs. They may only be hurt, and we must find them, she said, her eyes dilated with excitement. I don't remember how we got down the stairs. I do remember expecting every moment to be killed. The cook was at the telephone upstairs, calling the Greenwood Club, and Liddy was behind me, afraid to come and not daring to stay behind. We found the living room and the drawing room undisturbed. Somehow I felt that whatever we found would be in the courtroom or on the staircase, and nothing but the fear that Hasley was in danger drove me on. With every step, my knees seemed to give way under me. Gertrude was ahead, and in the courtroom she stopped, holding her candle high. Then she pointed silently to the doorway into the hall beyond. Huddled there on the floor, face down, with his arms extended, was a man. Gertrude ran for it with a gasp, gasping sob. 
Jack, she cried. Oh, Jack! Liddy had run, screaming, and the two of us were there alone. It was Gertrude who turned him over, finally, until we went to see his white face. And then she drew a deep breath and dropped limply to her knees. It was the body of a man, a gentleman in a dinner coat and white waistcoat stained now with blood. The body of a man I had never seen before. So that is the end of chapter three. So next week we'll be getting into chapter four. I hope everyone enjoyed today's readings. And I hope everyone has a fabulous yorny day. Be the light and bye!